the goal for our series here is to provide a framework and an opportunity to talk and discuss the issues that we're face in salmon recovery, the rationale for it, the progress we're making, the effectiveness of that, of the actions we're taking. You know, while um, building agreement uh, among stakeholders, practitioners, and scientists for what we what we need to do next. And uh, just remember, we're all um, early in this initiative as we get started here. At the last meeting, we had a review of harvest management and the legal and biological frameworks that underpin it. And the topics for those upcoming meetings uh, will be framed around uh, specific uh, Chinook Salmon Recovery Plan chapters, um, as well as and including a deep dive into the uh, progress uh, made with respect to the uh, Skagit Watershed Estuary. So um, today, uh, it's a great pleasure to have Eric Beamer here, um, senior scientist with the Skagit River System Cooperative. And I don't know if it's senior scientist emeritus yet, but it may be getting close. Um, and he's going to talk about the Skagit uh, Chinook Salmon Recovery Plan. And then Richard um, will discuss the council's strategic approach and the implementation structures for that. And then we're gonna have a, a panel with uh, the Washington Department of Fish and Wildlife and the tribes and, and some ability uh, opportunity to have a discussion and questions and answers. So with that, I'm gonna turn it over to Eric. Yeah, here we go. I'm Eric Beamer, I work with Skagit River System Cooperative. Um, we do um, fisheries management for Swinomish and Soxhawtl um, here in the basin. I got tasked with uh, a really big task to try to explain the Skagit Chinook recovery plan in a relatively short period of time. And I just wanna apologize in advance. It's hard to distill something that's 300 plus pages in the main document and then 200 plus pages in technical appendices down into one presentation. And then the other thing I wanna say is that this is about what the 2000 five plan says um, as best I can in a short period of time. It's not about what the plan could have or should have been or where we're at now, 15 years later, implementing aspects of the plan. Those, those conversations can be had later. Um, and specifically, as John said, um, the, an update on where we're at with the estuary strategy part of the plan is planned for June. Uh, June 8th. Um, so with that, I'll get started. SRP is Salmon Recovery Plan, so I'll use that acronym throughout the talk here. Um, then we'll go through some background that mainly uh, I'm doing a little picking and choosing, but the chapters one through three, and then in particular chapter five, um, provides really good background for the actions part of the plan. Um, and then to develop the actions, we definitely had to have goals. So that's chapter four. Four, and then there's what um, I call objectives, and um, it's kind of that's what's stated in the plan. But other people think of as goals if they're smaller scale. But those are articulated or summarized in chapter 16. But they're also within the action chapters. Then we'll dive into the action chapters, and that's where where the plan states what should be done to achieve the goals. And then we'll end with uh, how it all adds up. That's chapter 16, so that's a, a short chapter that explains whether or not, in the view of the authors of the plan, all the actions can achieve the goal. And then lastly, there's um, two chapters about research to fill information gaps and, and monitoring to, to uh, feed back into adaptive management. I'll, I'll just briefly say some things about how and why this plan was constructed the way it was. And then also just a chronology of the review and adoption process um, by NOAA. So when I say ESA, the Puget Sound way, that's uh, if you look across the country for implement, implementing the Endangered Species Act, Puget Sound is a little bit unique, um, at least was at the time, um, because it included a, gra a grassroots or bottom up step within the process. So one of the ideas was that the plan would be more well accepted and more likely to be implemented if grassroots level um, expertise was um, 
part of assembling the plans. And so that's one thing that was unique in Puget Sound rather than having the governing agency with jurisdiction making a plan and top down pressing it down on folks to 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 implement. So um, so Puget Sound's unique that way. There's this combination of bottom up, all the watersheds producing plans, and then NOAA um, evaluating and adding, you know, their their part to the to the plan. So that's just something to keep in mind. Puget Sound Chinook were listed as threatened in 1999. Then plans, the process was in place for folks to um, develop the recovery plans that included all these watershed chapters across Puget Sound, including the Skagit Chinook plan. That was submitted to NOAA um, in June of 2005. That's often when we consider um, the, start, the starting date for plan implementation because many aspects of the plan were, um, were kind of underway and agreed to um, and some initial things were, were done before the plan was even adopted. So anyway, there is about a year and a half period for review um, and there's a technical review team Puget Sound TRT, um, I've listed the names of the representatives. There were actually more people when the individual watershed plans were um, reviewed. Um, so uh, it's a bigger list than that. And then finally the plan, including the Skagit chapter was adopted in 2007. A Little bit about the um, plan itself. So we cite it as Skagit River Cooperative and Washington Department of Fisheries 2005 Skagit Chinook Recovery Plan. It, I've seen it cited a lot of ways, but anyway, that's who we say the authors are. But on the right there, you can see the title or a um, acknowledgement page that lists folks that are authors, contributors, reviewers, um, and support. So I guess the thing to point out is the list of authors, contributors, reviewers, it's just alphabetical order. It doesn't mean one did more than another. There's many folks that worked on this. Um, so it's inappropriate to like, I've seen it listed as my as me as the lead author and that's just not true. There are some things I'm a leader author, but not the whole plan. A couple important things, the intent of the plan, I think it's really important folks know that the co-managers, the local co-managers presented the plan as a specific pathway to meet the goals, but very, very important. The plans explicitly states that there could be other ways to achieve the goals. Those other ways would be vetted through an adaptive management process. So that's important to keep in mind. It's a starting point and you'll see later in our later presentations, there's learning that's happened. There's adaptations that, that should um, and could be um, implemented. So then the main purpose of the plan is to define the biological based goals, identify what's known or assumed about limitations on Skagit Chinook and then propose the actions. Um, so that's it in a nutshell. And you can read, I would recommend reading the executive summary if you don't want to read the 300 or 500 plus pages, it's pretty good. And then and the plan has um, a really detailed table of contents. So you can, you can dive deep um, and kind of keep track of where you're at. But basically that's the whole purpose of the plan. And that was the purpose of all all the watershed chapters um, in the Puget Sound Recovery Plan. It, you're supposed to be able to find it on NOAA's webpage, um, but it punch you to the partnerships webpage now where you can download the contents and zip files. Um, so the water, the Skagit chapter of the Puget Sound Recovery Plan is in volume two of the Puget Sound Recovery Plan. That's where you would find that. Um, there's also, when the plan was adopted, there was a NOAA supplement to the Puget Sound Recovery Plan that called out deficiencies in the overall plan and some watershed unique deficiencies. Fundamentally, the supplement included the implementation strategy for Puget Sound as a need and monitoring, um, heavy hand on monitoring, um, especially habitat status and trends monitoring. Is, and I may be forgetting a few other things. That's a separate document to the, the, whole, the Puget Sound Recovery Plan. Our website hosts the Skagit Chinook Recovery Plan. There's a separate link on our website to the whole plan. That's the 327 page plan and the individual appendices. So that's, that's, there's eight of them, I believe. And those are really important um, 
because they they link into particular places within the plan. So um, in particular, I'm most familiar with, because um, I le was lead author on Appendix B, C, and D, and those were ones that were important to making, um, diagnosing the causes of decline within life stages that then were linked to um, habitat restoration actions in certain places of the watershed. Some background, I just wanna draw your attention to chapter two too, because there's a whole chapter, it's just a few pages, but that is a glossary. So when there's acronym, I know there'll be questions about acronyms, I'll probably use some that without defining them, but there's all, all that stuff in chapter two and it's, it's really good, it's really detailed. Where I'm gonna focus is mostly on chapter three, which is basically called the assumptions and where we go through and we talk about how we viewed um, Skagit Chinook to diagnose the causes of decline and therefore what needs to be fixed um, to achieve the goals. And then, and then I want to cover how chapter five, which is after the goals chapter, links kind of back in with the assumptions. So we'll, um, we'll do that a little bit as we go. Um, but one thing I want to point out is that the chapter five, it's it's different than the action chapters. It's a, it's a summary of many years of work of the Skagit work, Skagit Chinook work group, I think it was called, um, a co-manager and multi-agency um, effort that was led by Bob Heyman to identify significant factors to the decline of Chinook or Chinook productivity. And then also documentation of factors that were evaluated, but assumed not significant. And those, those findings, it's sort of a narrative. It's not mechanistic necessarily. The mechanistic part of those uh, significant factors are, are, are illustrated in the um, action chapters. And then there's these um, technical appendices that explain the details of how the mechanisms were understood scientifically and then what models were used to make predictions. So that's how, that's how that works. And, now getting to the backgrounds part. So Skagit is, is one of the watersheds in Puget Sound ESU. It has six of the 22 ESA listed populations. So it's also happens to be the biggest basin with the most water and the most fish. That's the scale that the Skagit has to fit into in the Puget Sound recovery plan. But Puget Sound Chinook recovery, this is the spatial extent of what needs to be considered. And that's because these fish live out their life cycle, not in the same place. So we have to, and this is a slide that Casey showed um, in the first presentation that just showed the, the jurisdictional spatial scale too for the laws that are governing harvest. This also absolutely applies to diagnosing and proposing um, actions for recovery because this is, this is where the fish go. We use a life cycle approach to figure that all out because we can't just Think about it all at once so we have these boxes and arrows to to think about discrete problems or actions um, and so this is our fundamental process life cycle life stage approach with that we see these different juvenile life history types and so you know all the fit all the juvenile fish of course are going to start geographically you know ex there's a geographic pattern to it, but in the freshwater, so the blue box, some of the fish move downstream relatively quickly after they emerge and some of the fish stay in the freshwater. You're starting to get, wherever you have branching, you have diversity in life history expression. Um, so again, as you move downstream into the estuary or the tidal delta, some move through quickly, some reside for weeks to months. Um, it happens to be that the ones that reside in freshwater tend to move through the estuary relatively quickly once they start migrating. And then you even have some further branching within the Salish Sea near shore. Our, for our box or bin, um, that was at first the Skagit Bay um, near shore, and then it, it grew bigger, included in the recovery plan to the Whidbey Basin. Um, but the paradigm kind of applies to the whole Salish Sea. Although the further you get away from the Skagit, the less nearshore dependent the fish are. But anyway, this is a cartoon of the, of the, the life history diversity that is in our basin. 
and that we had to um, account for in the recovery actions. Um, just a just a um, a plot of the central tendencies of the of the different um, cohorts going through the system from freshwater to new, near shore. Um, you can see the um, the different timings of of the cohorts. So another thing to point out is that there are hatchery populations, and they they look especially the sub yearling populations. They basically mimic the par um, the par migrant um, sort of paradigm. Um, where obviously they're staying in a hatchery in fresh water, um, but then when they're released, they generally move rel relatively quickly through the system. So these are things to keep in mind as sort of differences, but bear in mind, there's a lot of over, there, there's tales to these distributions that where there's overlap um, across the different life history types. Um, at the time, acknowledging life history types at this detail was a really big deal um, for for planning our recovery plan. Now it's much more common. Another thing, and this is a slide Casey showed. So within the recovery plan, it's not news to everyone, but it might be news to some people. The way fish populations work is not more fish begets more fish always. There's a functional relationship. It can be a straight line where more spawners means more recruits, but more often than not, it's some kind of curving line where after a while, um, you have limitations on how many more recruits. This is called density dependence. And you see that at the life cycle scale, which is what this is, or you can see it at a life stage scale. Um, this is it's an example of the estuary um, rearing box. And so the Skagit populations do exhibit um, density dependence across their life stages, uh, across their life cycle and in many of their life stages. So that's built into um, how we, um, develop the actions for the, for the um, recovery plan. And then now I'm switching to the recovery goals. There's adult goals. The recovery goals are for adults. They were developed across Puget Sound by the co-managers. Um, and they were developed with the premise that they're biologically based, meaning that they're not high in the sky, they're possible to achieve um, and they both achieve population viability, which is something that NOAA under ESA is really concerned about, but also include meaningful harvest. There were goals set the same way by co-managers or developed under the same sort of methodology by the co-manager for all the basins. We were, uh, Bob Heyman worked on the goals and, and the rest of us that worked on the plan were sort of handed the goals to figure out the actions to achieve them. Um, the goals are specific. This is a really important point. Goals, the goals are really confusing to people because they are really a stock recruit function. They're a line. They're a curving line. Okay, so the two points, one's maximum surplus production. That's what it says in the plan, but the plan sort of interchanges words, MSP or MSY, maximum sustained yield. Um, they're the same thing. So basically, um, MSP is where the plot on the point along that curving line where you have the maximum um, abundance above the one to one or replacement line on that stock recruit function. And then the other part of the goals are articulated at equilibrium, and that's where spawners equals the number of recruits. Um, so it's there's a productivity of one. one, one spawner begets one recruit. So that's how the goals are illustrated. Um, so it makes, it's really important to understand that because you can't just look at a statement and say, oh, we're recovered or, oh, we're not recovered or just solely recruit numbers and, and say, oh, we've recovered. It's more complex than that. And so it takes multiple years of a pattern to have this stock recruit model to judge whether or not you're, where you're, where you're moving. Um, and I'll, I guess I'll leave it at that. The goals are articulated in high and low marine survival regimes. So these are the plots of what marine survival um, were used to develop the plan. So we have this is something that we monitor and we have many more years of data for that. But anyway, you can see that there was a, a shift. There was an early period where you had an average um, marine survival that was a lot higher than it was in the 90s. That was built into the goals. So. Here's the tables right out of the plan that show the goals for the six populations, as well as a row for the aggregate of the spring group 
or the aggregate of the summer fall group. And so this is for lower marine survival and you can just look at the bottom line um, for the summer fall management unit, the aggregate and at MSP, you get a resulting recruitment of 37,000 fish at a MSP escapement of 10,600 and your productivity is 3.5 recruits per spawner. That's how that works. And that, um, it's not that important for you to know um, the specifics of the goals. You need to know that there are goals, there is a measurable, there is an outcome, and that they change. It changes a lot depending on how marine survive, how the ocean is is uh, performing for Skagit Chinook as well as other Chinook. Um, here's the high marine survival goal again. Go to that bottom row. Um, lot bigger number, 115,000 recruits but you need a bigger escapement, 19,000, and your productivity is higher. So that's how the goals work. And that's where the reference was, the actions in the plan are supposed to achieve those goals. Um, there's also what I call objectives, and those are juvenile life stage objectives. Those are found in um, chapter, sort of summarized in chapter 16, um, but they're also in the individual chapters, the action chapters. Um, so the, Briefly, there, there are capacity changes for life history types. So yearlings, um, the current capacity was estimated at 107,000 and the re restored capacity the, with the actions in the plan would go to 130,000, so on and so forth. So that's, that's the objectives. And those are how we added up the individual more life stage based um, um, uh, actions to the adults um, by applying marine survival rates to those um, small um, capacity numbers. And then coincident with those juvenile goals, because they're geographically um, correlated, um, there's habitat objectives too. And so I won't go into the details on those, but those will absolutely come up in later presentations. Okay, now we have the action chapters. So there's harvest management, chapter six, there's hatcheries, which is chapter 13, but in between is all the habitat chapters. And so there's habitat protection, chapter seven, and that's for, for, for the, all the watershed council folks. That's not land acquisition, that's regulatory habitat protection. And there's a general restoration strategy that basically says the approach that we're using, which is a life cycle um, process um, based restoration approach. Um, and then there's the for um, sort of life stage specific restoration chapters, one for spawning, one for freshwater rearing, one for estuary, or the tidal delta is called in the plan, or, and then another for the near shore. So I'll go through those, uh, but I wanna point out how this works. So the way, um, and I'll put this bullet on. So you need to know that some of the chapters adopt existing regulation or administrative processes as their SRP actions. So for example, harvest and hatcheries adopted the already existing regulatory processes to ensure that that harvest and hatchery practices are supportive of recovery. Um, and there are some other places where things were just adopted. So the Skagit, the current license of the Skagit hydroelectric um, project was adopted the, um, as, um, uh, as part of the protection chapter. Some of the forest and fish regulations specifically on industrial forest lands, the, which happen to be in mountain basins, mostly in the Skagit, the um, certain actions were adopted as the, act, as the um, prescriptions for, for assisting recovery in, in watersheds. The idea of the plan is this pie chart, which I think is really helpful for people because I've often heard people say, well, the Skagit recovery plan you know, the priority is the estuary and that's the yellow part. Really, if you were to prioritize, and I really just like the word prioritize, I think sequence is a lot better word, but we're not prioritizing anything. You need to do all the actions in the plan to achieve the goals. That's, that's what the plan says. Actually, the burden of the plan, 61% of it is if you protect ha the status of the 2005 habitat, well, then you just add to that. Um, so you, protection is a huge, huge part of recovery and maintaining um, 
the population status of the of Skagit Chinook. So it's these other slices that are the restoration. Um, I feel like I didn't explain that very well, but anyway, that's that's the gist of it. I think that people get in their slice, especially if you work in recovery and you do certain types of projects, you get enamored with what you do and kind of miss the big picture. But the big picture is all the actions need to be done to achieve the goals. Um, and there can be adaptation within those actions, but the pie is still 100%, 100% needs to be done. For the harvest management chapter, chapter six, where Casey and others did a, a full hour presentation on, basically it's a long section, but it, its essence is it adopts the, the administrative process to review fisheries and make sure that they don't impede recovery and are supportive of recovery. Same thing with hatchery production. The habitat chapters, again, just remember habitat protection is not acquisition, it's regulatory protection. So the underlying principles, these are some bullets that came out of our presentation to the NOAA TRT. It's based on, we need to maintain the current level of habitat status, 2005, I already mentioned that. Um, and it uh, definitely acknowledges that the authors, which are the local co-managers, aren't 100% responsible for getting this work done. It's going to be implemented by others, agencies with jurisdiction at all scales, federal, state, local. Um, so they all have a role. And then in many instances, there may be different proposed actions, but they need to link back to the plan and have some evidence that it's going to achieve the goals of the plan. So that those are sort of the underlying principles. And chapter seven, the protection chapter, really was a list of many recommendations about regulations. I will circle around to a couple of the specific ones um, as we wrap it up um, later on. So then we have chapter nine, which is spawning and egg incubation habitat. The details of that are in appendix B. So a lot of sort of the explaining of the science and the model that was the simple model that was developed um, to make predictions. But basically uh, for all these next action chapters, they sort of have the same theme in the way I present them. So there was, there's some evidence of a bi biological mechanism that, that's limited. And then there's some evidence from habitat conditions showing a, a causal link to that and a decline and therefore a restoration opportunity in this case. Um, watershed level sediment supply and hydrology restoration was the was the um, generic um, strategy. Um, so the we did make a sort of a broad uh, prediction about um, about um, what the outcome would be of that watershed um, restoration, and that was a simple um, cohort survival model to predict the benefits of of um, improving upslope watershed conditions for hydrology and sediment. So I'll go through a few of the, the high level, I guess they're sort of detailed, but sort of high level. But anyway, so we have this biological evidence where we see when you plot egg to fry survival by uh, flood recurrence interval, this is a uh, log scaled. And so just plotting where beds are stable versus beds are mobile, you see this decline. Um, so there's a huge flood effect um, on survival. And then we looked at um, watershed conditions in a um, sort of a water set analysis approach, not necessarily mechanistic, but correlative, and saw impairments in peak flow hydrology and sediment supply. And then we back calculated what egg to fry survival would be if you had all the watersheds uh, functioning. So if the idea is that if you had functioning watersheds, you wouldn't have as mobile a stream bed, you wouldn't have as deep a scour, you wouldn't have the mechanisms to crush and bury and abandon eggs, um, you wouldn't have suffocation of, of eggs in egg pockets, those sorts of things. So these are the maps that came out of the analysis, ones for sediment supply, the um, lower um, map, and ones for peak flow hydrology. And in, in essence, the plan is trying to take the watersheds that are shown in um, reddish or pink and turning them into green. So they're functioning in that category defined as functioning. And if you did that, you would go from this function for escapement to, um, to migrants to this function. So it's an increase from 340 fry per spawner to 435. So that's how 
that's how that was um, um, applied and it's applied broadly, but the actions were um, sort of administratively thought about. So there was forced and fish laws for industrial landowners that um, basically dominate the land ownership pattern for many of those red, most of the green watersheds are in federal land status. So anyway, both of those um, land use status needed to change a watershed from red to green or a part of a watershed from red to green. And the forest and fish laws, the, the existing laws were adopted as doing that. And in fact, preview to maybe a, a, a future presentation is that they've actually done that work by and large. Um, and then on federal lands, there's specific places that need restoration. Some of the places don't need restoration. Um, and then there were specific projects related to um, alluvial fans and other road issues. And so that was in essence sort of the list of actions for that chapter that should achieve the biological outcome of improved survival. Freshwater rearing chapter 10, details again are in appendix C. So we had evidence of loss of habitat area. Um, and then in this case, looked at gaps in rearing opportunities, that was a big deal. Um, and then we have evidence of the mechanism that loss of rearing habitats causing a problem to the population that inference is could be reversed. So it led to candidate restoration projects, some specific, some reach level to figure out, um, figure out what to do, um, but large river floodplain, alluvial fan um, types of projects um, to restore hydrologic process to um, channels and the riparian floodplain functions. So in this case, we used an intrinsic capacity model to predict juvenile benefits um, for individual candidate projects. Just a summary of what the habitat conditions are. So kind of a bleak picture, the non-tidal delta there on your right at the top, um, historically huge, um, massive amount of places that fish could live, you know, 98% loss under current conditions. Um, sort of the same, but not as large a magnitude of loss, but the large river floodplains. So that would be Skagit, Sauk, Seattle, Cascade. Uh, floodplains have a 31% loss. A sizable amount of the main stems rip wrapped. Good evidence of loss off channel habitat, backwater areas, some of the habitats that juvenile Chinook are keen in on. So um, the bottom map is just a, a a reach that we call the middle Skagit reach. So it's the Lyman Hamilton area. And the blue polygons are connected floodplains, the red and pink polygons are at some degree of isolated floodplains. So you, you're seeing that there's you know, encroachment on the habitat forming processes and, and showed the loss of habitat area and length in those um, shadowed and isolated areas. So portfolio restoration projects that were sort of planning scale to specific scale were, were essentially to um, restore those isolated areas. I don't have a map of showing a, a gap, but there's, there's a fair amount of talk about filling in the gap areas so that fish have a, have a corridor to a safe corridor rearing to move through the system as they, as they migrate. Biological evidence, and this one is actually hugely updated. Um, in 2015, we published a paper that really verified that the hypotheses of density dependence, um, as well as the survival link to flooding um, on, the earlier, on the earlier part was, was just really verified. Um, Mara Zimmerman and others. If we plot smolt out migrating the Skagit River, you see in their size, you see early in the season that there's they're all really small. And then at some point they start increasing in length. That's a reflection of the fish migrating soon or delaying in freshwater rearing. When you plot the abundance of these fish that have exhibited rearing in freshwater, you see not a strong evidence of more fish begets more fish. So this was the data that we had during the Chinook plan years, planning years. But we have you know 30 year, or uh, 25 years of this data now, and you see that there's an average amount of par migrants in the system that's about a little under a million fish, I believe. In the case of the recovery plan, I think it was 1.3 million. But um, and then the excess, the there's way more fish that migrate as fry. This is shown as a percent, but the abundance it's it's massive. So in any given year of out migrants, 
there's sort of a level amount that stay in fresh water and all the excess goes downstream. That's evidence of the habitat filling up. And then that was extrapolated by this intrinsic, mo intrinsic capacity model where basically densities of fish per habitat type were applied to candidate projects listed in the plan. So you'd have a, a project that had a capacity estimate for its um, benefit. Next, tidal delta and near shore rearing. I lumped it together because it's really sort of all estuary, although the tidal delta is a much huger place and where the bulk of the rearing is, but the behavior of the fish is somewhat synonymous. Um, and we learned about the biological mechanisms by understanding the fish in the near shore too. And also the models that made predictions for uh, benefit were synonymous, say the same model. Okay, so it is titled Delta Habitat, probably everybody knows, but basically we have two kinds of channels, the open-ended ones, the tributary channels that reflect the river flow mostly, and then tidal channels often blind-ended, but reflect the uh, signature of tides as a main forming process. And then all the wetlands in between, the vegetated wetlands, it can be estuarine emergent marsh or scrub shrub or even riverine tidal, um, forested um, tidal wetlands. So all of that, that's the estuary, that's the tidal delta. And then in the near shore, well, we looked at all the near shore, we focused on pocket estuaries and then all the things that contribute to um, forming a sustaining pocket estuary. So here's Lone Tree Lagoon as a pocket estuary. In ESRP lingo or Pisner lingo, this is a barrier embayment. The, our plan says pocket estuaries. But anyway, there's all these components. The fish live in the drowned channel lagoon or the, and, the, and the creek that goes into it, but you need the functioning spits and sediment source beaches to actually have that lagoon where fish can live. So all of that matters in the, in the recovery. The, the chapters do talk about in a general way that we have to do restoration of process to maintain the habitats where the fish are. Um, specifically, this was called out in, in, well, in all the chapters, but that's the mechanistically is called out in the near shore chapter. Current habitat conditions, biological mechanisms. In this case, we looked at migration pathways as an important mechanism too. Um, and then all that led to needing more delta and pocket estuary habitat. Um, and then this, in this case, we used a stock recruit carrying capacity model. So this was the most robust of any of the models um, that, that we um, used to predict uh, benefits. And I should say all the models used are empirically based from Skagit data, which is pretty unique um, across Puget Sound. A lot of basins were basically using literature, um, you know, values for their predictions, if they made predictions. All right, habitat change. So both the delta and pocket estuaries are smaller and more fragmented. The pocket estuaries on the right are the dots. So there was a lot more dots, a lot more opportunities historically than there is currently. Same with the delta on the left, huge corridor of connected estuarine habitat, really from the Stillaguamish to, um, the into Padilla Bay, which is now a lot, lot smaller and more fragmented. When you do the math of where the fish could actually live, most of it's lost. And that's actually one of the better stories in Puget Sound. We have more left than some places. So you would think that for life history types that would depend on estuarine habitat, that that would matter. And it does. So when we looked at that stock recruit type of relationship, I showed you earlier, um, even at the time of writing the recovery plan, you know, we see the evidence of this curving line. So more smolts into the, going into the estuary didn't necessarily beget higher densities in the estuary. Um, and we saw this is, you know, you can use other metrics for density dependence analysis, not just abundance, but you could look at the size of fish and you actually see the mirror image. So as you had more and more fish going into the estuary, they, they, they were smaller, so evidence of crowding and not as good a growth or displacement. Um, and in this case, we saw really strong evidence of displacement. So as you had, as you filled up the delta, you had more and more fry out in Skagit Bay early in the year. And well, if you noticed on that plot, when I showed the life history plot, there was a little peak of fry that are in Skagit Bay in like February and March. That's not a good way to survive as a salmon. 
So this all added up that the delta is filling up. And then we found out that about these pocket estuaries that the ones that are displaced, if they can find a pocket estuary, they basically mimic delta rearing in that substitute non-natal um, habitat. There's a whole story about landscape connectivity or the connectivity of habitat, but here's a cartoon sort of of, of the bottom line of it. The thicker the arrow, the more fish are, are taking that pathway. And then there's, um, and, and, and the direction is the pathway, obviously. So you can see that not all arrows are really thick. Um, there's, there's not many fish getting into the swim channel corridor. There's not even a pathway across Fur Island. And historically, there were several, um, I forget how many, I think it might have been five individual distributaries, not necessarily five immediate branches, but when, by the time it got to the bayfront, um, different distributaries, those are all missing um, from the historical time. That matters in dispersing water, sediment, and fish. So the recovery plan meant it's aimed to increase capacity, but also help balance out some of these pathways. And so here's the candidate restoration projects um, that were in the recovery plan and evaluated for carrying capacity um, bump. And so those are those are in the pink polygons. Um, and then we we've overlaid the historical wetland area just as a guidance to see where like you it's possible that you could have estuary habitat. That's not saying that we wanted historical extent. It's just a sort of a match of realistic, you know, are you planning to have estuary habitat in historically estuary habitat? It's a sort of a, a bathymetry um, match, um, but also gives a sense of how much the recovery plan is actually asking for from its current condition in reference to current conditions. So there's also um, two major connectivity projects, one called the Cross Island Corridor. It was the candidate project was shown along Brown Slough. Um, that's not necessarily where it may be built. It could be someplace else or to date, um, there is no corridor project built. Um, so who knows if it's gonna get built, but that one um, is planned to help pipe sediment or water sediment and fish to these areas then make them more beneficial, um, higher use. Also through McGlan Island, this is, this is a bottleneck and it's the pet impediment for fish getting into Swing Channel and also um, some of the other metric freshwater um, although, and sediment, although generally don't want sediment in Swinomish Channel because it's a navigation channel too. So that's a conundrum of restoration planning and feasibility to, to work through, which most po folks at the Watershed Council are really used to understanding and working through. So then there was the pocket estuary projects too. So these, these dots were the candidate pocket estuary projects um, that are linked. These are the ones that are close by to the Delta. So fish can get to them basically on one tide cycle. Um, and we mapped connectivity of the Delta. So the outlet of the distributary to these different pocket estuaries to verify that idea of closeness. That's what's in the action chapters. How does it add up? So the bottom line is the, when you do the math of all the predictions for individual projects, it, it didn't add up to getting to the goals, but there's a discussion to that. The whole freshwater chapter didn't really have a lot of specific projects. So there's more, you know, look at this reach and figure out the project. So there would be a lot more restoration that could be done than what was in the plan. Um, that's the goal of the strategy. And then there's also in the habitat protection chapter, um, there's things that um, we think also uh, would give a lift, not just a, um, keep the status of 2005 habitat, but it actually over time would give a lift to recovery. So, um, and then also in this idea is that we would advocate to do restoration in such a paradigm that we're restoring processes and increasing connectivity and complexity and general, and, and it's a safer way to do restoration rather than just solely engineering around problems where you may not understand the ecosystem as well as you think you do. So if you restore processes in the context of allometry of habitats and historical context, you're more likely to get productive and sustainable projects. There's some tables in chapter 16 that you can see the math after, after 
um, adding up the benefits of all the projects back to the goals. Um, they're in the 70% range at the low ends and some, when there's marine survival is high, you get, you know, you get more than hundred percent. So that's sort of the math and the, the accounting of the plan. As far as I know, um, we might've been the only plan in Puget Sound that did sort of this accounting. These are the list of the habitat protection recommendations that we thought um, would provide a lift, not just protect the status of the trend. So, of the, um, of the uh, status of 2005 habitat. So, and, that, and I'll just use one as an example. So at the time of the plan, there was the Baker relicensing hadn't been agreed to, but it was envisioned that if it, it was agreed to the way they were thinking, that it would provide a lift. And in fact, it improves survival um, of, of eggs in the downstream reach because of the flow agreement. So that's just an example of how one protection action is doing more than just keeping the status of the 2005 habitat. Lastly, we're to the learning um, chapters. So a couple, I'm gonna be real brief on those um, and I'm almost done. There's a research chapter and a monitoring chapter. They use the same adaptive management framework. Probably people are making these diagrams a little better than what we did back in 2005, but basically you learn by research or monitoring and then feed that back into understanding the constraints in the population, which then behooves changes in the actions maybe, um, and you keep going. Um, it's meant to be adaptive and it's adaptive over a variety of scales and forums. So a couple, um, there's a plug for, there's this watershed scale, um, adaptive management, that's, and there's a regional or ESU scale. In some cases, these forums are legal processes, or in the case of the Watershed Council, for some, for some scope um, of, uh, um, of uh, recovery implementation, it's within the standing committee and the monitoring adaptive management committee. Um, and they're, they're both broad and specific monitoring or research things. I will just talk about a couple of real um, sort of just examples. They're not necessarily the most important. They are ones that maybe folks know about. I think Richard's gonna pick up on this one, but basically learning about pocket estuaries and Chinook salmon origins, we've expanded the, not just to pocket estuaries in Skagit Bay, but all of the Whidbey Basin as being beneficial to to um, schedule Chinook salmon. And that's been translated into an update in the Watershed Council's um, strategic approach, I think is what it's called. Uh, some folks have, year, we made a lot of assumptions about the yearly life history type. And so there's been multiple um, uh, initiatives to study and learn about yearly Chinook life history to feed back into planning and, and uh, planning better restoration projects for their benefit. Um, habitat status and trends is a big deal, a huge gap at the time of writing the plan. And you saw how important it was, 61% of the habitat burdens on, on protecting existing habitat, but we really didn't have any data. So a big part of that is to learn about those trends of habitat across the uh, basin that are important to fish. And so I'll show, I'll show a quick picture of that. Another big topic, um, is pinniped predation. We assumed in our plan that it wasn't uh, a limitation to Skagit Chinook um, that we, especially that we were going to um, treat as an action. Um, but there's been folks learning about that and maybe there are some actions, they may be as extreme as predator control, but more likely um, looking at where you accumulate habitat conditions that accumulate predators um, and therefore they're more effective. So those sorts of things are in the mix. Um, just wanted to remind you or show you that the monitoring is really in place. Our basin is in a really good shape for biological monitoring. We're monitoring it um, pretty much as many life stages as you can monitor um, as a co-manager process. This is a slide Casey showed. And then this is just one example of a habitat. ST is status and trends. Here's a status and trend result from our habitat, our broader habitat monitoring um, for that protection of existing habitat, um, basically a scorecard of restoration and natural 
and human changes to habitat. Um, this is just a snapshot from, from the estuary from 2004 to 2013. Um, yellow is where you've gained habitat. And most all of those yellow polygons are um, from restoration. Not all of them. There's a bunch of small ones um, where there's been some gains. Um, but then there's red polygons. A lot of those, the vast majority, except for two that you can't even see, are all from natural changes or not direct human changes. Um, there may be sort of indirect human changes, like we've changed the way sediment um, deposits across the delta. So now it's more um, apt to erode um, with sea level rise. But there, the, the good thing is there was there's no evidence of regulations not doing their job and, and we're losing habitat because of bad regulations, at least in the delta. So those are just some examples of how things are being monitored, trying to add it back up to um, understanding the progress on the goal. And we'll talk a lot more about these specifics like at our next presentations. Last, I think I have two slides. So last, I just wanna remind people that a lot of times when we're in the weeds doing our work, we forget like the big picture. And this is just conceptual diagram where you know we're, we're on this decline in Puget Sound Chinook, Skagit Chinook, um, and then we wanna make it better. We do have it, the plan has an endpoint goal. It's above the current status. A lot of times people just wanna make things better from the trajectory of current status and think that's recovery. It may or may not be. If the slope is still negative, it's just more expensive and long-term failure, it's still, it's still a failure. Um, you know, you could have no slope, that's better than still failing. Um, but we're really wanting to get to the goal. So I guess I would just offer that as we are in the weeds of doing our work, that we still try to have our actions add up to the goals. That's really, really important. We often, I often hear things about, well, this is a higher priority than that. I go back to, well, maybe you wanna do something before the other, that's sequencing. But if you know you need to do all these things to achieve the goals, they're all priorities. Um, so anyway, my little sort of two cents on that. And then the last thing about, what about new things? <laughs> um, I, I just like the movie Up, sort of the picture of like, we're, we're enamored with something um, you know, we love the Skagit Chinook plan. And then, oh, the new thing comes, the shiny new toy. Um, that's going to happen. We got to work really hard to not get distracted. So we need to use an adaptive management process to learn and consider the evidence and not just go willy nilly with the new, with the new shiny tools. We want to stick the path. We want to have a suite of actions. It's never going to be as simple as one, one thing that it's going to fix everything for Skagit Chinook. It's always going to be complicated. It's going to be spread across the life cycle of the fish. Um, it just is what it is. Um, and we need to do our adaptive management really well. And we need to keep track of it. Otherwise, we won't find our, we'll find ourselves in a different place. And we won't necessarily know why we're there. I, I don't know if everybody you know, knows. Eric mentioned it a couple of times. But that recovery plan uh, has a lot more basis and local information and sort of resources and, um, you know, uh, science, science power from lots of different agencies in it than most um, recovery plans in Puget Sound. And, um, you know, really how we implement it and then track all of that is, is uh, essential. And uh, keeping track of institutional memory um, so that we don't lose that. And that's part of this process is getting all this documented and explaining it and sharing information across a broader audience. Uh, my job uh, today is to share uh, updates for everyone. So they have a, a hopefully a, a clear picture of how we're implementing the habitat aspects, particularly the voluntary habitat aspects of that Skagit Chinook recovery plan and um, the structures, the organizational structures that are in place to do that implementation. And um, a little unlike what uh, Eric presented, which was really kind of a snapshot for the most part in time, the 2005 recovery plan, going to try to cover the last uh, 22 years 
of um, this implementation process and it'll still leave um, questions for folks, but we uh, hope you'll ask those questions and help us structure the next um, few presentations um, as we move forward with 2022. But I wanted to start with kind of an origin story of the, you know, the Watershed Council and the, the groups that have gotten together to implement salmon recovery and uh, definitely wanted to recognize um, the origin, the watershed and the tribes that live in the watershed. And this is a picture in the upper watershed um, near Gorge Lake, I believe. Um, and uh, heard a great story from Scott Schuyler uh, just uh, two days ago at our Kiwanis group about the Sacred River and their history there. And so just thought it'd be good to start that um, with that discussion. But next, um, the, it's just to set the stage for the origin story, as far as I remember, um, just the dwindling salmon runs in the 80s and 90s. And then the response to those dwindling salmon runs were co-managers who were responsible for hatcheries and harvests. They acted to reduce those catches. And so their catch rates are, as you heard at our last meeting, significantly lower than they they used to be. And um, in response, the locals who control habitat in the watershed formed uh, a group to get together and, and start discussing how to reverse the dwindling salmon runs. And that became known as the Skagit Watershed Council and formed in 97. And just the following year, Washington State passed the Salmon Recovery Act we call it the Washington way, people getting together and working together towards solutions. That happened in 1998, which led to the creation of lead entities, which led to local tribes and local governments designating the Watershed Council as the lead entity for salmon recovery. I want to be uh, really clear though about what a salmon recovery lead entity is. Of course, the RCW, says that you have to have a physical agent, a lead in a coordinator, and that's the Watershed Council. And Andrea and I um, work on the coordination part here as staff, but a lead entity is really a process um, that maintains a technical committee and a citizens committee that represent watershed-based interests and together develop strategies to restore salmon habitat and support those organizations that are implementing um, those strategies. And specifically, the uh, task at hand each year is to produce a ranked list of projects that are our smart, smartest habitat investments that are supported by the science and community. And at its essence, that's the lead entity program. And then there's a lot of tasks that are involved in making sure that that outcome is the best outcome each year, uh, including adaptive management and project planning, things I'll cover in a moment. But you see the map on the right, you see the Skagit watershed in purple, and we are just one of 25 lead entities in the state that have been operating since 1997. So here's a too detailed organizational structure of the Watershed Council. And of course, the, the broadest box represents our 45 members who are all doing something for salmon recovery in the watershed. And I reference two committees, the Lead Entity Citizens Committee and the Technical Review Committee. And essentially those are broad-based committees that are doing project, annual project reviews. They just get stood up and sat back down each summer to do project reviews. We're in the middle of that process now. But essentially those are, in the case of the Lead Entity Citizens Committee is the board of directors plus other members to fill out the rest of the watershed interests in the basin. And then the technical review committee is our technical work groups, which are standing year round, um, plus some other members to uh, improve our technical review process. And of course you have executive director and staff working between those groups and subcommittees who are working all the time. So that's the structure of the Watershed Council. We can talk about this more later. Um, and we're responsible for the, particularly the salmon dedicated funds 
But in truth, these voluntary habitat projects that are happening in the watershed, the Salmon Recovery Funded Funding Board projects are just a portion of the recovery projects that are happening in, in any watershed. There's other voluntary habitat programs out there. For instance, uh, our uh, land owners have been good stewards of the land for generations, so voluntary work being done by landowners. There's estuary programs focused on estuary restoration, like the ES Estuary and Salmon Restoration Program, conservation programs, passage programs, floodplain programs, riparian programs, there's a salmon treaty and commission, and heck, let's throw in mitigation and mitigation banks, um, depending on where they spend their resources and how they spend their resources. So this uh, slide is essentially the voluntary habitat component of the recovery plan, right? And so if you boil that down to the four H's, habitat, harvest, hatcheries, and hydro, all that voluntary work fits only in half of the habitat piece of the four H's. There's also all the regulatory protections that Eric mentioned, federal, local, GMA, and shorelines, water quantity, and um, hydraulic code, those kinds of things. Together, that makes up the habitat bin. Eric spoke to, and last month, Casey and Bob spoke to the harvest bin, which is managed by harvest resource management plans and the federal government's oversight, and hatchery genetic management plans, which is not a, a big issue in the Skagit because we don't have production hatcheries in the Skagit, and then hydropower. Uh, which, of course, we know about the two um, dam operations in the system. So those are the four H's. And the part of this slide is just to show what's in and what's out. The Watershed Council's perspective, we're really only involved in this one piece. But we have to know as a team everything that's going on if we're going to get to the bigger goal that Eric mentioned. And of course, there's H integration when you look across all of these H's. Um, to make sure that your habitat actions are not in conflict with your hatchery actions or vice versa. And that when hydropower is acting, that it's not acting in a way that's offsetting. And in fact, it should be supporting the habitat actions that you have plans for. So that's how we work across the system. And as a system, that is salmon recovery. Um, just the last thing that I wanted to point out is, as Eric spoke to, and we'll have a future presentation on, all of these are subject to adaptive management cycle. And so we make a plan and we implement the plan and then we'll evaluate that plan and then we'll make changes if they're necessary and the cycle starts over again. And so um, there's lots of information there. We'll be talking about that as we move forward. So that's kind of the structure, um, how we fit into the larger Chinook recovery plan that Eric presented. And so I wanted to talk about what our habitat strategies are. Of course, this is um, Hosamine Lake and Hosamine Mountain in the upper Ross area, it's beautiful. But our habitat strategies are a foundationally from 1998 when we first began. And it's interesting, you'll see the overlap with what Eric presented because um, this is where we really started putting together the pieces of habitat and how it supports fish. And a lot of them were adopted into the recovery plan. But before the recovery plan, we had this strategy. And this strategy laid out our conceptual models about what the ultimate controls of the habitat were and what the proximate controls were and those processes that formed and maintained the type and amount and quantity of habitat. And we really uh, went to great lengths to make sure that we weren't addressing sort of symptoms of problems, but we were looking at the controlling factors and working as far upstream, not literally, but sometimes literally, I guess, as possible. So these are our conceptual models that we documented early in the process. And then we looked at um, these different functional curves. So for instance, one in the lower left is the buffer width um, of what is a functioning versus a moderately impaired or impaired uh, riparian area. And the strategy went to great lengths to identify uh, 
um, what would be called um, filters and screens for what kinds of projects would be acceptable to implement uh, Chinook recovery that they were cost effective. And so in this case, you'll see that for uh, riparian width to be functional, really needed to be 40 meters, about 130 feet. And so since 1998, we've not funded projects that are less than 130 feet uh, wide, because um, as I pointed out, we're trying to restore function, um, not continue to sort of build on impair, impaired areas. So that was the rationale, and that's just one example of many in the strategy. And then we looked across all of the different species and looked at these different habitats. So there's tributary habitats like pool riffle and forced pool riffle that were key to uh, the survival of all of these one, two, three, four, five different species that they were interested in. And others like plain bed or step pools that were really secondary to most species. And then they found that the main channel, off channel and estuary habitats were also key to the vast majority of those species. And so those became our priority um, uh, aquatic habitats. And again, based on a multi-species approach, and then we applied a cost effectiveness filter. So in 2000, we published another document, which is really the application of those strategies. And so they looked at key habitats. This is early GIS, very rudimentary maps. Um, but the blue areas were those reaches where they're most beneficial to salmon, places we should be working, what's in the box, what's out of the box. And sediment supply, Eric introduced what areas need to be um, restored so that sediment supply is functioning. <clears throat> and then in riparian areas, green are those functioning riparian areas and red were the non-functioning riparian areas and um, what, what needed to be on the table to be restored. Um, and so through 2005, we used this strategy to benefit multiple species and their key habitats. And we directed about $20 million through 14 sponsors to 56 different voluntary habitat projects. So that takes us up to 2005 and the creation of the Chinook Recovery Plan. But the Chinook Recovery Plan then brought some changes to how we implement the habitat portions, voluntary habitat portions of recovery. So beginning with the Puget Sound Partnership was formed and became the regional recovery organization with those 15 different watershed chapters that Eric showed you a map of. And so we really try to work at a Puget Sound scale for recovery. And then we wrote our first strategic approach that is um, essentially combining the Chinook information to prioritize where we're gonna put investments for Chinook recovery. And so in that process, we really moved away from multi-species to Chinook, but I hope I've made it clear that um, the, a lot of the key habitats that Chinook rely on are key, ha key habitats for most of the other salmon species in the system. So it's a focus on Chinook with um, collateral benefits for other species. And in this 2005 uh, transformation, we've also uh, focused solely on native Chinook. There's six Chinook populations, as Eric referenced, in the watershed um, in, shown in this map. Uh, but it does leave out the Samish River because the Samish River is a hatchery population of Chinook. Um, and then we really prioritize the larger floodplains and the estuary supporting multiple Chinook stocks. So further down the river you are, all six of those populations are gonna be using these areas. But if you're in the upper Cascade, for instance, only uh, the Cascade Springers are gonna be using that area. And so there's a way to put some value points around that. Okay, so a couple slides on the strategic approach. Uh, we kept all of our guiding principles from the 2000 report, um, protecting and restoring processes and focusing on the most biologically important areas. We created these tier one target areas where we should be putting most of our resources. That includes the large floodplains in yellow and the estuary in red. And then our second priority are the, the smaller floodplains with one Chinook stock in green, the tributaries in purple, and the pocket estuaries in the area outlined in green. 
And then of course we have priority objectives for each of those tiers. So there's a very focused hypothesis and set of prescriptions for how to operate in these areas. Things that have evolved since the 2005 Chinook Recovery Plan One is the recovery plan had the big four uh, Chinook producing tributaries. And we did an analysis in the the membership of the Watershed Council in 2015, I think it was. We identified the 14 largest tributaries with the most rearing habitat for Chinook salmon. And so now we have these 14 tributaries. It's a little bit different than the recovery plan, but they're good alternative rearing habitats for Chinook. As Eric mentioned, we expanded from the uh, Skagit Bay pocket estuaries to the Whidbey Basin pocket areas in green. We have a growing focus on riparian areas as the science has continued to develop and as we recognize um, the potential impacts of climate changes. And we now have a watershed-wide acquisition strategy. That's, we call a protection strategy. Uh, but it's a voluntary protection strategy, not a regulatory one. And so acquisition might be a little clearer where we've essentially at a landscape scale, we've looked at thousands of parcels in the watershed and we prioritize them for where the best remaining habitat exists. And then we also have uh, reach level project plans. So for instance, the middle Skagit um, or the Sock River where we have these detailed plans that are in process or have been in play for a while that really identify what's happening at a reach scale. Uh, we've uh, worked with the Department of Fish and Wildlife, TNC and farm interests who have taken the lead on doing multiple benefit project planning in the estuary we're happy to um, uh, see where they think we should be working next in the estuary and then the adaptive management framework. So these are things that have evolved since the Chinook recovery plan and kind of give you their supportive and uh, what I'd consider, you know, uh, part of implementing the Chinook recovery plan. And so it kind of gives you an idea of some of those things that we've been working on the last 15 or 17 years. Uh, Just a couple of last updates. Wanted to uh, give you an update on where we are with the lead entity process. So we're entering our 22nd year of funding projects. The 196 projects have been implemented for about $105 million. Those are just the the salmon focused projects and don't include uh, many of those others, but we do coordinate well and we use resources to match one another. So we've captured most of the big projects in our database. Um, There are major repeat sponsors who are really doing the vast majority of the work. That includes uh, Skagit County is a a major player in salmon recovery. Uh, Of course, our local tribes are doing a lot of heavy lifting in the voluntary habitat world. The Skagit Fish Enhancement Group, Department of Fish and Wildlife, Skagit Land Trust, and Seattle City Light are also major repeat sponsors. So this year, including this afternoon, field visits this week, we are looking at 13 new projects, and that's about an $8.3 million uh, capital improvement program for 2022 that's on the books. And I think this is my last slide, and I want to credit Andrea McBride on our staff who pulled together these resources, but one of the tools we maintain is a four-year work plan. On the left is just a real simple Gantt chart of um, projects. I'm only showing you about the top quarter or 25% of the projects in our four-year work plan, Um, but it shows in gray the restoration projects in different phases and different years, and then um, in green is monitoring and orange is planning, and so it just shows that there's a range of project uh, types, and we kind of can anticipate when they're going to be coming to us um, and can look for funding in advance. So for instance, uh, there's about $38 million of proposed projects in this four-year work plan. We have access to or anticipate about $13 million of funding coming in. And so over the next four years, we're short about $25 million and we'll be looking to raise those funds through various processes. So that's an example of the job of the Watershed Council as a coordinating body working with those 45 members to pull all this information together. And on the right are pie charts of the proposed spending showing that, you know, the vast majority of the spending is going into our highest priority tier one areas. 
and that the vast majority of the funding is for construction and restoration, but there's also design and feasibility and monitoring work that's happening. John? Thank you, Richard. I want to open the floor to all of you and for any questions or comments relative to Eric and Richard's great presentations. And John, we did bring um, and invite uh, some Department of Fish and Wildlife employees, and there's other co-manager representatives here, Bob Warner's from Department of Fish and Wildlife, and um, Casey Ruff, and uh, Scott Morris, and Devin Smith from other co-managers to help answer questions today. Yes, that's true. Thank you. And I would, I would add Bob McClure. I think he's still on the uh, yeah, yeah, Bob's probably around. Thank you. <clears throat> oh, I see a hand up. Jock, welcome. Hi there. Sorry about no video. I'm I'm using a different computer today, and I and it's uh, video isn't working. So anyway, I apologize for that. Nice to be here. Very nice presentations. Thank you. Um, I guess I guess my my big question in thinking about um, all the information that was presented today is what are the what is going on within the council and and supporting organizations to ad address how climate change could potentially be impacting you know, the recovery plans and the trajectories that, that were laid out here, and do you see some challenges there? Yeah, let, let me start with the easier part of the answer, which is um, we have a very robust uh, uh, set of strategies and recovery plan in place that give us a foundation for knowing sort of the the, what is what would you call them the the sort of controlling factors of habitat and we've been pushing from the very beginning to not address the symptom but to address the causes and so you'll see that we have this focus on um, restoring uh, degraded forests uh, forest roads and culverts and um, mass wasting and sediment supply upstream and a lot of that work now has been accomplished. Um, it, it, so that's, that's good progress. And then we have a focus on restoring processes in the floodplains downstream. And so my, my point being that um, we actually had uh, some of NOAA's scientists come in and take a look at our strategies that we've been implementing for the last 20 years. And there was not a single one that folks said, well, you're doing this wrong. In fact, they confirmed that what we're doing is um, the majority of the work we need to do for climate, but not, not everything. And so I think that then begins to point to where maybe Eric and the, the researchers and scientists like at the Skagit Climate Science Consortium can continue to tell us how things are gonna change and what additional factors we might need to include. Um, so that's a whole nother answer level, but um, that, I feel very comfortable that what we're doing now is appropriate, um, but maybe not everything we need to be doing. I mean, I, I, I guess I would just offer that in a simplistic way that, um, I mean, not in a simplistic way, the, the plan did acknowledge climate change and did did have some illustrations in particular for some pressures like sea level rise and and a, and a first cut forecast. <clears throat> but a lot of those topics are followed up on and then we're collaborating um, kind of a big we in Puget Sound about those those pressures and we have specifically in the Skagit the climate consortium and they've produced some really good work, including um, predictions on certain climate um, outcomes. And so we're trying to use those to understand, you know, how to build um, better, more resilient projects. So back feeding back into design, Greg who works on some of that stuff uh, as well as others. And then, um, and then understanding the benefits are the benefits the same as what we originally predicted. So um, some of the stuff that I know in particular is the estuarine stuff. So we see with temperature, we're probably gonna have an abbreviated, um, a shorter rearing period, um, which will change the capacity benefits and probably the growth potential. So those things are being learned about and trying to be fed back in the system. Yeah, yeah. I guess, um, thanks for that, both both Richard and Eric. I guess in the, in the simp to put this in the simplest sense, that last figure that you showed, Eric, of the trajectory for recovery, I don't think climate change 
impacts in the basin are going to change the slope of that line in a positive way. And so, so do the restoration goals change in order to compensate for handicaps, essentially, that, that will be placed on the system in the context of climate change? Or maybe it, you know, the work that you do will be surprising and we'll see uh, some positive you know, benefits for fish in the context of climate change. I'm doubtful. Um, but it seems like it's critically important in terms of trying to meet goals for recovery. And it is the Skagit may be in, in a better position than many watersheds because you still have a lot of snow in the upper watershed and you have a big high flow river in the main stem that that is not likely to get really hot in um, in the summer. So anyway, thanks. I appreciate I appreciate it. I think it's something to think about. Yeah, so just lastly, I don't know if you were at the beginning of the presentation, but we're we're mostly reporting about what was in 2005. Um, and then the, the relevant part to what was in 2005 is that we have an adaptive management view on things. So we better be using it and learning and applying what we learn. And climate change obviously is, is a big part of that. Um, so, yeah. Peter, you have your hand up and welcome. Thank you. Yeah, Eric, that was fantastic. I really enjoyed that a lot. That was a lot of good information. I learned a tremendous amount. The one thing I'm always concerned about is, is how are we capable? Or how do we do with counting how many salmon are coming back? And uh, it's great to see the increases in going out, but coming back is still a concern for us. How do we know the success of recovery coming back anyway? <laughs> so I can, um, so you're, you're basically asking a question, are the methods good enough to get uh, accurate or usable estimates for accounting of fish? Mm -hmm. And that the answer to that is they're definitely usable because we've been using them. Everyone has been using them. There's legal frameworks to use those, say, those numbers. There's a whole co-manager process to agree to numbers and in a simplistic sense, could they be better? Absolutely, whenever you're estimating something, you can always do better. Yeah. Um, so part of the learning process is learning where our weaknesses is, weaknesses are, um, and, and it's for, in terms of priorities, what to add on, you know, based on funding or needs. We filled gaps like completely absent habitat status and trends monitoring and didn't work on estimating escapement better. But there may come a time that we'll wanna, wanna revisit some of those things. Um, and there, I think the other, the other meeting talked about some methodologies that may be useful. And so that would be what I would say about that. But I know that those folks that do the work on say the adult assessment work, they can chime in on visions of how to improve estimates and whether or not, um, they're biasing our, our view of things. I see Casey. Yeah, I think Casey, I thought Casey might want to have something to say. Yeah, no, I was actually, I mean, it's a good question, but I was curious kind of what more specifically, you know, there's different components of adult return that we, we monitor. So including um, uh, harvest um, monitoring. So the number, we, we monitor the number of, of salmon that are caught in commercial and sport fisheries, salmon returning to the terminal terminal area. We have, of course, you know, we do it pre-terminally, but, but um, we have a, we have a really accurate, um, accurate methodology to estimate the number of fish harvested in commercial fisheries. And I think, you know, where, where I think there is room for improvement is our, in our escapement estimates. Um, and I think, you know, importantly, the, the methodology that has been applied to estimating escapement has been applied consistently over time. And so, you know, I think the word consistent is important because that allows us to really, when, when, when it comes to um, monitoring, you know, population status and trends, that, that enables us to do it. So um, um, to do that, um, but as far as, as, far as improving um, estimates, I think there's always room for improvement. And I think store managers are working on, on different impro approaches to improving escapement estimates and improving our coverage. Um, for our, our escapement estimates. 
Has anybody been thinking about the overlay of the in-stream flow rule adopted by ecology as it applies to the system that we're looking at, the strategies and the climate change risks. So for the, the answer for the 2005 plan, and I, I can look, double check this, but I think that incorporated the in-stream flow rule as a condition. Um, so it, it accepted it, um, but the plan, as far as quantifying, um, it didn't need to quantify benefits. It would be, it would, it would have been in the status of the 2005 habitat. So moving forward, I know that there's a process to review. I mean, there was a study or a review of the stream pro rule and, and basically said recently, and it basically said, well, if we did it, if we did the analysis now, we could probably do it better. We know more about fish. We have better hydrodynamic models. So um, there may be a group that's interested in um, using a better model to make better, you know, predictions. But that is not that would be in the category of a, a new action. And if it were if it were to happen, then it would have to be evaluated and and either you know accepted as an amendment or an adaptation to the plan or something, but that'd be something moving forward. Um, currently, all our research and monitoring is incorporating um, local environment. So depth, depth, velocity, salinity, temperature, things that we didn't have as well um, or as, as in, um, extensive back in the 2005 era in our analysis. So we'll be able to use those sorts of things and make better fish predictions now than we than we were back in 2005. That helps. Um, so Eric, Jen was wondering in the counting of adults uh, per spawner, recruits per spawner, and specifically adults, did you look at differences in that ratio between the different life history types? That, and it referred to what you presented at the beginning. Yeah, so we- and, uh, Yeah, go ahead. Um, so we weren't really able to do an, a quantitative assessment of the which of the six populations expressed which juvenile life history type, but we did have a, um, a small sample that was a genetic based way to look at the presence of um, each of those life history types in the genetic signature of the six populations. And we found evidence of all of them that's reported um, present in in each of the six populations that's reported in Appendix D. Um, but I should say that the, the genetics are really tough um, in the Skagit, so there's a fair amount of uncertainty. Um, the novel, the news was at the time was that the springers weren't all yearlings and the, mm -hmm. and the falls weren't all sub yearlings. There was a mixture. Um, so we still don't know any much about the, the details of the different populations expressing um, di different life history types. But I will tell you the, the summer falls are tend to do better <laughs> um, or, or, or the ones that are um, the biggest populations and, and seem to be the ones a lot in the estuary. Um, I think Casey could maybe talk a little bit more to that, but, but anyway, yeah, that's where we're at with the uh, knowledge on the correlating the six populations with juvenile life history types. My question was really the focus on the water system. You know, the Watershed Council and the Chinook Pan Plan focuses a lot on habitat, land habitat, estuaries. But I'm really curious if um, the original uh, plan focused at all on the temperature of the water, the biomass of the water, the insect and larvas needed for the development of fry, and, and where has our focus been and discussion, and since the plan, have we, have we adapted and focused all on that? Thank you, Eric. Yeah, I can. I I can chime in on that and then others can too, but basically the one thing to understand, so there are some specific temperature and productivity prescriptions 
or uh, linkages um, made in the chapter seven of the plan where there's, you know, like TDML actions um, and, and that sort of thing. But the premise of the plan is really, um, if you're restoring natural processes and you're restoring the footprint for those processes, you're going to get the right temperature regimes and flow dynamics and productivity. So we didn't have the models and we chose to not go down the detailed pathway of like having everything hang on a temperature preference curve or something or a, an IBI for insects or something to, to make our fish benefits. We, we made them based on the stock recruit curves and we linked it back to the habitat in a paradigm where you're restoring processes so that those local finer scale things, metrics that are super, super important um, should be developed. Now, that was the plan. Now, moving forward, we're trying to learn about how those work. And so a lot of the, a lot of the estuary work is including bioenergetics. So we're looking at the prey and the, um, the prey as well as the prey availability, the, what fish are eating as well as what's available the bioenergetics of it, like how warm is the temperature and how, how does that all work? I mean, that stuff is being incorporated um, as well as physical tolerances types of patterns with, with fish. So a lot more detailed now. Um, it, could, it could lead to a lot better learning or more precise learning, but I think that the plan in 2005 does a good job of getting the, pig, the big picture right. And if it's followed, you know, where we restore footprints with process, the right process, we should be getting that function. And that, yeah, other others working in the watershed should chime in. See, Bob's oh. got a camera on, he might want to weigh in, but, oh, yeah. Yeah. but it's Bob, also you wanna... to, to mention that um, the Skagit hydro relicensing process, there are a lot of um, pieces of the study that are happening that are looking at um, temperature and um, you know flow modeling and how to uh, optimize that downstream. And they also have a very extensive uh, monitoring effort to look at um, uh, macro in invertebrates and um, productivity of the system. So actually the current work is very extensive and will add a huge body of language or information um, for us to incorporate it into management moving forward. Well, I'm also, you know, salmon used to return and die in the river and that, that used to kind of feed. And I wonder if anybody's looked because we're having less return. Is that then, you know, affecting the, the small fry and that whole concept that we've, we've kind of touched on about throwing carcasses back in you know, as much as we can into the river bottom that again feeds the system. And I don't know if anybody has really looked at that, but I'm really curious about, about that little piece. There, is a, there was a state effort to, Jen might know more about this, but to monitor the effectiveness of carcass uh, placement mm -hmm. projects. I'll look that up and I'll send it to you offline. Great, thank you. Yeah. 